those are just some of the questions, okay? Uh, 15 questions that you can ask your oncologist. Doc, do you recommend ton tonsillectomy? <laughs> Sir, Jack is saying... No. No, you... you, you um, but what is a tonsil? Basically, they're the, uh, the, the glands. Lymphoid, yeah, yeah they're the lymphoid organs. Lymphoid organs. Mm -hmm. So basically, when you're actually removing part of the lymphatic system, you're, you're talking about not being able to properly drain the lymphatic mm -hmm. system anymore when it's gone. Well, the lymphatic system is very important, oh, lalo na yung mga lymphoid organs natin, because they make lymphocytes, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a type of uh, cell that is responsible for killing viruses, okay? So... Um, lalo na kapag ka, nagkaroon ka na, tinanggal mo yan, yung mga lymphatic organs mo, usually, masalo, masalo ka nagiging prone sa virus inf viral infection. So, I really do not recommend tonsillectomy. Lalo na pag malalaki. No? There, are, there are several ways how you can handle that. So, if you have enlarged tonsils, you can use actually honey. Mm -hmm. uh, so, pwede ko kayo mag honey, even garlic ha. Garlic, you can use it for tonsillectomy. You can or also instead gargle. Of. Yeah, instead of you can also gargle with uh, virgin coconut oil. We call it oil pooling. So it's around ten to fifteen minutes. You can do that. There, there are many things three that were done. Times a day. There are many Baking. things surgical procedures that were done years ago that mm -hmm. just aren't pretty rare nowadays. Like when I, when I was a kid, it was very very common. Uh, if a kid got a really bad sore throat and swollen tonsils, they just take them out. Mm. You yeah, know, but as well, um, back in the day when a woman yeah. would get a lump in her breast, they would simply just cut the entire breast off as a radical mastectomy. Mm -mm. And now... But here in the U.S., they don't do that as well. It, it's a very conservative yeah. approach now. But mm. a woman is going to choose for some sort of surgical option. It's very common for her to have, you know, a, a lumpectomy mm -hmm. if she wants to go a surgical route. Or, you know, they'll, they'll treat the tonsils as mm -hmm. opposed to removing them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that's, I'm not going to tell tell you what your doctor should do, yes. but do your research. Mm -hmm. you know, always do your, do your always, research. Always do your uh -oh. research, simply because... And it's better right now, because right now, because of the advent of technology. The advent of technology, it's, is, just, it's really, really wonderful mm -hmm. because you people have uh, so much data access mm -hmm. at their fingertips. They can basically study all aspects of their condition mm -hmm. and find out, you know, you know what their options are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know... Again, if you do your research, you can find that these things are, are valid. Like, mm -hmm. like, for example, you know, there, there are those that say, well, I don't know if Boston C is any good. Well, you know, Boston C was presented at the World Health Organization, you know, because of uh, in vitro and in vivo tests that were mm -hmm. done at St. Luke's in uh, Manila. Uh, there's, there were 16 years of clinical uh, studies that were completed. Uh, and so... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that it's going to cure all that ails you. I would never say that. Mm, okay. But it has a significant track record of success. Now, for the dialysis, okay, I do not advise anyone to stop their dialysis, okay? You decide. Hindi po ko magdi-decide. I'm not going to be the one to decide it for you. But you, you yourself will decide if you want to stop it. Now, if you ask me, if you ask me, Doctora, do you know anyone who stopped uh, doing the dialysis? Yes, I know a lot of uh, friends who have stopped uh, doing their dialysis, but I do not advise it, okay? You decide for your own, okay? So that's it. And then you take for the dialysis for CKD, baking soda, again, one teaspoon three times a day. <laughs> So what are we going to be discussing today, Sir John? We're going to discuss something that's a, a very, very important subject because there are a lot of folks nowadays, obviously, who are getting diagnosed with cancer or uh, significant illnesses. And oftentimes, folks don't know what to even ask. They don't even know where to start asking questions because, uh, like, for example, uh, when I started uh, dating Dr. here, we were asking each other hundreds, thousands of questions. Um, but so often what happens is when someone is diagnosed with a cancer, uh, they'll go see an oncologist and they are typically so overwhelmed by that, that whole experience, by that diagnosis. They don't even know where to start. They don't know what to ask. Uh, and oftentimes they're very afraid to even ask. They're afraid they might offend somebody. But the issue is we're talking about life and death here. And uh, there should be 
no question that shouldn't be uh, asked or, or on the table, correct? Mm -hmm. Because it's, for example, I mean, if your your wife is is dying of cancer, you should be able to ask anything, shouldn't mm -hmm. you? Shouldn't yeah. You? So we're gonna be discussing about all of their questions. So, questions. so what's the first question? The first question is, so for example, you have been diagnosed with cancer. So your doctor said, uh, Jack Bunch. So you have colon cancer. This is the first time you're gonna see mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna see your oncologist. So you went there, you said he, he told she he or she told you that you're gonna do chemo or what. So what is the first question to ask? First question to ask is, is it all right if I record this conversation? Again, first question to ask is, is it all right mm -hmm. if I record this conversation? Well, when life and death decisions are at stake, conversations with uh, oncologists and any other physicians really take on an enormous importance. Mm -hmm. uh, if the doctor objects, that's a big red flag because you got to be un un trying to wonder why would they object to me recording this conversation? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes these conversations will take place when the doctor is really, really busy and mm -hmm. also the patient or their family, they have a lot of thoughts running through their head. They're very, very stressed out. Um, so basically given the, the subject, how important it is and really the hurried bedside manner of most physicians and the emotional intensity for the patient and their family, mm -hmm. it really can be really hard to listen at that time and understand and ask the appropriate questions. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> if you can ask if you can record the conversation with them, I mean, it can really provide you a lot of benefit because you can really concentrate on listening to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, you're not having to worry about taking notes or not taking notes. You can focus on your questions mm -hmm. uh, and you can replay and review that conversation at a much less stressful time or in a much less stressful environment in your mm -hmm. home. And be, be basically you got to make sure that all parties understand that you are, you know, uh, going to record the conversation. Mm -hmm. They have to agree to it. And again, if they don't agree to that, that should be a big red flag. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, uh, like me, when I was uh, seeing patient <laughs> in Phil, and uh, some people, some patient, they would come and see me, and they would automatically record me, so without even asking uh, for permission. But I totally understand, because there's a lot of people out there that I see, and like what Sir Jack was saying, there's just so many emotions. Oh, yeah. So they get so excited, you know, um, they are frightened. So the thing is, it's uh, if it's okay, me for me, it's okay. If someone records me when I'm talking, well, anything that you really say impacts a life of a person. So it's for me, it's better to be recorded. Next question. Why do I need chemotherapy? Again, second question is, why do I need chemotherapy? And that's another great question because, I mean, the thing is, you need to really have an explanation as to why. Mm -hmm. And you let them explain why they think that's a good idea for you. Mm hmm so that's the second question, okay? The third question is, why aren't we considering immunotherapy instead of chemotherapy? And again, you know, why aren't they? Because, for example, in the U.S. and in many parts of the world right now, immunotherapy is the gold standard as far as treatment against cancer. You were a pioneer in that in the Philippines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so instead of using, you know, something like chemo, which poisons, the body want to mm -hmm. use something that would stimulate the immune system. So mm -hmm. you know, have, basically have them explain that. Okay. So number four is, do you have experience with immunotherapy? You know, and if, you know, you really want to know that about your oncologist, because if they speak out against immunotherapy, you need to find out why, because like I said, it's a gold standard in so many parts of the world right now. Mm -mm. And also understand that <clears throat> chemotherapy is how the majority of uh, oncologists earn their income. Um, they don't earn income from recommending dietary advice and lifestyle modifications. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is the goal of chemotherapy? That's uh, question number five. This is an area where people can often be confused because you'll hear words uh, like palliative. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so what really needs to be asked is this intended to be a curative or palliative treatment? Uh, because understand palliative treatments they're intended to provide relief from the systems, mm -hmm. um, the pain, the physical stress, and the mental stress of that terminal illness. But their role is not uh, to prolong life. Okay. So number six, are there other treatment options for me? And is chemotherapy really the best option for my situation? 
And this is where you really need to, like I said, continue to question everything and investigate the, the treatment options that you have. Mm -hmm. Okay. So number seven is what are the risks? benefits and possible complications for the chemo yeah i mean the, the thing is if you're going to listen to all the the benefits or mm -hmm. the, the benefits that you're being told about it you want to have complete disclosure um, are you gonna lose your hair yeah, am I gonna lose my hair am I, yeah am I, you know, my teeth gonna fall out you yeah know? some some patient they do not know they don't know uh, I mean, this they, is what they just go to chemotherapy and they just you know they just uh, go there and then after a while they will complain like doctora I, why is my hair that, falling yeah. why am i always vomiting why am i nauseated so they just find well, find it out when they're already doing chemotherapy so mm -hmm. you have to ask first uh, about the risk, benefits, and possible complications. Yeah, that's, that's what we call therapy. informed consent. You know, mm -mm. you, you got to listen to both sides of the coin there. Mm -hmm. So next is how often do your patients experience any problems? Great question. Mm -hmm. How often? And number nine is, did you send my pathology to another doctor for a second opinion. Basically, the pathology of your tumor cells tells the pathologist whether or not you actually have cancer and what kind. Um, and having a second opinion <clears throat> by another pathologist from another hospital or diagnostic facility mm -mm. really helps you ensure you get a proper diagnosis. <clears throat> because well, there, there really have been, and I know you, you, you think about this a lot, Mom, there have been a lot of unfortunate situations um, where patients have been treated inappropriately mm -hmm. before they come to you uh, because the wrong kind of cancer was diagnosed. You're right. Uh, I, I have a lot of patients that came up to me back then. They didn't, ev they didn't even have cancer. Yet they were treated for and it. They and they had mastectomy, they had chemotherapy, and radiation. radiation. And then it will come out. It was it were, it were all uh, negative. So it's very important for you to do a second. And if you can afford it, third, fourth, and fifth opinion. You know, when uh, I, I used to have this teacher who has who was diagnosed with a rare type of cancer. This was when I was in college, and she said that she went for a second opinion, and the results were different. So. First was she had cancer, second there there was none. So it was one one and one. Okay, pro <laughs> there's me, there's a cancer and then there's no cancer. So what she did was that she went to a third doctor and the third doctor said that she has no cancer. So two and one. And then she went again to another doctor and the doctor said that she had cancer. This is the fourth time. So she went to a fifth doctor, and the doctor said there was no cancer. So finally, that's where she stopped. Uh, yeah. So it, it was funny because it uh, you can see like uh, some doctors they're they're really it's like coaster. no some doctors some doctors are like any other profession you know. And they are. It's I'm, it's called opinion. Just opinions. I mean, these are doctors are just like you. Um, they're just like anybody. I mean, they're just they 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 chose a career. They took yeah. courses of study. You know, they don't have some all-encompassing wisdom. They're just mm. making judgments based upon the information they have and the knowledge mm -mm. that they have at that time. And basically, I mean, it's it's really standard procedure in most hospital settings to send the slides out, you know, for a second opinion. Uh -huh. So if that's your situation, just ask to make sure that that's been done. Is there Has someone else looked at my slides to confirm your mm -hmm. opinion? Yeah, so you have to always ask. That's very important, actually. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the first thing that I always tell people when they come to me. You have to ask second, third, even fourth opinion if you can afford it. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so number nine, uh, number ten. How many patients have you treated with my diagnosis or type of cancer? It's a great question, and you, you know you you can expound upon that. Not only how many, but uh, which treatments did you use? Mm -mm. Uh, are any of those patients still alive? Mm -hmm. uh, how many have survived more than a year, five years, 20 years? Mm -mm. Can I speak with some of them? Mm -mm. You know, to see what the quality of life for them has been, uh, if they've been able to return to a good quality of life. Mm -mm. I mean, because you, you really want to get a good idea of what the oncology ex experience is, you know, with the, you know, the various treatments they're recommending. Uh, and you should find out as many patients as you can that they've treated in your age range with your type of illness um, to be able to make the best decision you can. And ask if you can talk to them. Um, you know, other patients just like you have been through 
that same therapy so that you can really have an idea and gain valuable insight on what to expect. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is, uh, back then, okay, here in the U.S., be- before the advent of technology and, you know, everything, modernization took over. So before, when you're going to work, when you go to a different state, because it would take a while, okay? And then the thing is, there's just the harsh environment. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's winter. So when you're going to pass through that state, you hire someone who has a... Uh, who's gonna who's gonna help you pass through help that state there. yeah so you, you you hire them based on their experience like how many people have they have they delivered to a certain place who are still alive because the problem back then is mugging so they are being robbed by so many people left and right so you have to possibly if you can possibly get the best person to help you and the same with, thing with, with our health works. The same thing with our health. You have to get the best oncologist or the best doctor to help you out with your problem. And be careful you take your advice from because Mm -hmm. understand there are many experts out there that have more degrees behind their name than thermometer, but they don't have any, you know, clinical experience. Okay. You know, so just be aware of that. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that if they they have a doctor there and they are... uh, 60 years old that they have treated tons of patients, you know, some of the doctors really, most of them, they're just teachers, not really, I'm not saying just teachers, like I'm just saying they dedicated their life on being a teacher. Yeah, they're an academic, they're not a clinician. So uh, most probably uh, the some of the experience that they have, uh, uh, some of it would be just in book. So just be careful with that. Okay? I mean, like, like for example, uh, Health Secretary Francisco Duque is a medical doctor. Uh-huh. But often, often speaks very, very um, uninformed, makes uninformed uh, assertions same, yeah. about things he just knows nothing about. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay. So number 11 is what is your specific treatment plan for me? Well, okay. Find out how many times they use this plan before on a patient. You don't want to be the guinea pig, but you don't want to be the mm-hmm. first one. Yeah. So you have to ask what are the specific treatment, treatment plan, how many months will it take, mm-hmm. like including the recovery. So yep. you have to ask that because you're not going to be able to work, especially as Filipinos, Iba, we're only, we're, we're just the, uh, the one who's working in our family, most of us, you know, because mm-hmm. we are martyrs. <laughs> so when we work, we're the only one who's working. And then, uh, when you're going to be incapacitated by chemotherapy, so you won't be able to work. Like how many months, doc? Because some of them, they got shock. Mm-hmm. It's even a, a year that they won't be working. So, yep. yeah, you have to know. Okay. Number 12 is what evidence can you provide that shows success with your treatment plan for me? This is critical to find out. I mean, how many patients survived that treatment and were able to resume a normal life? Mm-hmm. So number 13 is, can you show me where the survival information comes from? Is it reported in a peer-reviewed published medical literature? Can I get a copy of the article? Well, monthly medical journals provide survival information that uh, your doctor should be familiar with. Mm-hmm. And the oncologist should be able to support any survival um, or prognosis claim that they make uh, based mm-hmm. with data from published articles. Um, you should be really wary if they cannot support what they're telling you with any published articles. And you need to really pay close attention because oftentimes these articles that people will produce have been industry funded without any secondary scientific verification mm-hmm. or validation. You know, so it's just marketing. So be aware. Mm-hmm. Okay. Number 14 is what lifestyle and dietary changes will I need to make to improve the outcome of the chemotherapy and protect my body during treatments? Well, the, okay. the diet is where things get very important, especially in, in, you know, when someone's sick because uh, it is so critical, you know, mm. from what we've seen. So don't be afraid to ask to what extent of nutrition training uh, your doctor received. And I mention this because literally only about 20 percent of medical schools 20 percent of medical schools in the u.s require any nutrition training at all Mm -hmm. in fact the last time i checked you can actually become a harvard trained medical doctor without taking a single class in nutrition no okay so number 
15. Since the vast majority of cancer is shown to be a direct result of lifestyle, what are some of my specific lifestyle risk factors that contributed to me getting cancer? It's a great question to have. Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, if, if you don't know what caused it, how can you help to reverse that? Because the same lifestyle that got you sick is not going to be the same lifestyle that gets you well. Mm-hmm. Okay. So those are just some of the questions, okay? Uh, 15 questions that you can ask your oncologist. Okay, about chemotherapy, of course. I don't like chemo because in research it says it's on, it only has an efficacy rate of 3%. Actually, 2.7 lang, 2.6%. So I'm against chemo, okay? I'm against radiation because radiation can increase your incidence of developing cancer as well, tapos pwedeng masunog yung skin mo. So, I'm against that. But I'm pro-patient. Okay? So, pag yung patient ko, gusto nila yun, I do not tell them to stop. Okay? They just ask me, doctora, so, what do you think about this? And I tell them that, of course, I'm against them. Okay? And I tell them the reason why I'm against chemotherapy and radiation. But I'm pro-patient. <music>